And welcome back to Frankly Speaking in conjunction with Mayhe Rain. Joining me on the line tonight is my good friend, Julian DeMarco. How are you, Julian, buddy? I'm doing well. How are you? Great. Thanks uh, for coming on again. I know you've been uh, aching to talk about this Russia-Ukraine thing. I know I've been kind of quiet on it on social media. I'm one that wants to sit back and kind of get a, well, get a, a better rift about what's going on over there, because I think there's a lot of rush to judgment over there. And as I stop to analyze this, the first thing I can tell you, Julian, is I don't trust the media. I don't trust our government. I don't trust Russian government. I don't trust anybody right now. And uh, we're trying to make heads or tails out of this thing. Clearly, Western media has a narrative right now to paint the Russians as as the, uh, I guess, the next Nazi regime of sorts, if you want to call it that. Uh, it's a battle for Ukraine. Obviously, what's going on over there is, is horrendous. It's terrible. Nobody wants to see a loss of life. I'm not here to defend Putin. I'm not here to defend Ukraine. But clearly, something is going on over there. And we're being fed a narrative from the West that, well, I'm a little bit skeptical of. Uh, this conflict over there between Ukraine and, and Russia, what are your thoughts on it, my friend? Well, my thoughts are, again, I'm not one for war, um, at, but at the same time, sometimes war is the only way to get things done, but at but I don't think there's any good guys in this. Um, if, I will say, I guess, on a limb, I mean, if there are any good guys, Zelensky isn't one of them. <laughs> that That's my opinion. Um, the Ukrainian government is very corrupt. Uh, that's being overlooked. Um, what's also being overlooked is the fact that government, whether it is the United Kingdom's government or the US government, is sanctioning a sovereign nation and basically trying to impoverish its people, Russia, because of what its leaders are doing. And then all of these people that are Russian that live outside of Russia who are oligarchs, which, you know, in the West, we'd call these people entrepreneurs, but seeing as they're Russian, we call them oligarchs, as if the West, whether America or Britain, don't, doesn't have oligarchs. Britain and America most certainly have oligarchs. We just don't call them that. So there's semantics that are going on here, but, you know, just like Rama, Roman Ravanovich, I think that's how you say his last name, the, the owner of Chelsea's football team in, in um, England, he had all of his assets, his British assets seized. For what? Because he is guilty by association with um, Putin. And the same thing is happening here in America. And now you have all these Russian billionaires and millionaires selling off their assets as fast as they can before they get seized. Well, you know, I think it, you know, and people are people are all excited about this. Well, well, first off, okay, so you might not, you know, shed a tear for the billionaire or millionaire, okay? But these people have done nothing wrong other than the fact that they're Russian and they're somehow attached to Putin in one way or another. But yet, as far as we know, they have done nothing illegal except be Russian. So if the government, whether in America or, or in Britain, can seize your assets, what makes you think that you, as a little guy who doesn't want to inject your child with whatever the state propaganda is these days, and is like, no, I'm taking my, my kid out of the state-run school or, you know, my child is not going to be subjected to the latest trend of, you know, put X here-ism. And so they seize your assets. And the only thing you, the only crime that you're guilty of is a thought crime with no due process. So private rights have gone completely out the window due to this invasion of Ukraine. And everybody, like an idiot, is just clapping their hands for this 
Yeah. It, and it, this, this hysteria, this mind control, you know, it, it, it really, it really shows the state of the world, specifically the West, that fundamental things are okay to be pushed aside just because our leaders don't like what another leader is doing. Mind you, as far as I know, no Americans have died in the invasion of Ukraine. So what, what, what business is it of America to be sanctioning another country, impoverishing another country, uh, seizing the assets, whether you like the fact that they're billionaires or millionaires is irrelevant. It's the fact that it's theirs. And the, the U.S. government has no right to seize their property just because they're because of their ethnicity, their nationality, their race. Yeah, it really goes against everything America stands for in the first place. And it also sets up a sort of a precedence where anytime America goes to war with anybody else, those people of that whatever heritage or country they come from, they will have their assets Take it. So if we go to war against Japan again, I guess all Japanese will have their properties robbed. If we go against Mexico, all Mexicans will have their, their properties robbed. I mean, this is a very dangerous precedence, without a doubt, and I'm highly concerned about it. But as we look over there at, at this um at this thing over here, Julian, what I'm getting is that Putin, this is coming from both the left and right. Well, let, let's start. Let, let me start here. Actually, let me let me reverse that. Because there is there is a narrative that both sides hold right now, both the left and the right in America, that Putin is a killer and a murderer. Now, there's some on the right that will kind of quantify that, and they will say, "Well, we got there's some shenanigans going on over there. America's got their kind of their 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 footprints over there. Doesn't excuse the bad guy that Putin is, but." America has kind of stepped in the way there, and it's been American foreign policy that has given uh, Putin the insecurity for him to sort of, uh, well, in, invade Ukraine. But both sides say that Putin is a mass murderer, he's Hitler, he's a tyrant, and he's looking to conquer land and conquer whatever it is he's trying to do. He is the next, uh, uh, essentially, the next authoritarian, tyrannical leader that both the progressives and the classical liberals have always defined and 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 really and you know they've always despised throughout history. Well, that's calling the kettle black. I mean, the West has its fair share of tyrannical leaders. Look at them now. They're in office right now. So I I mean, so it's one tyrannical leader calling another supposed tyrannical leader a tyrannical leader. I, I mean uh, okay, I, I don't know what to say to that. It, it's just hypocrisy at its at its best. I, I mean, as it, you know, the United States will scream about democracy, 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 and how you know what's going on in Ukraine is against the democracy, but has other people on the mainstream left news media on PBS has already pointed out, if America cares about democracy so much, why in 2014 did it topple the duly democratic elected government of Ukraine to put in a pro-American government? So again, this is, the sa this is the same thing that would happen if Mexico all of a sudden got buddy-buddy with Russia. We wouldn't like it, and then we would go in either with tanks or whatever the case may be to say, like, look, Mexico, we don't like what you're doing, and you need to fall in line with us. Putin has specifically told Ukraine and NATO and the European Union and the U.S., like, look, the East is our sphere. You guys go be crazy over there in the West. If you pass this line, this is what's going to happen. Zelensky is like, I want to be buddy-buddy with the West. I want to do Western stuff. Because Zelensky is, you know, he's all for the new world order, all the international banking, all the global homo, everything. And Putin's like, you cross this line, we're going to have problems. Zelensky's like, I'm crossing the line. Well, now here we are. 
two weeks in, yeah, Putin I, said, don't cross this line. I, I, I don't know how, I don't, I don't know why everybody's acting like, oh my gosh, like what's he doing? He specifically said, don't cross this line. That's like me telling you, if you break into my house, don't step over my threshold. You don't have permission. And I have a gun pointed at your shoulder. And right. then you step over the threshold and I shoot you in the shoulder and you're like, you shot me. I literally just told you, this is what will happen if you do X. Right. You know, Julian, I, I keep saying it. I don't know if Putin is a good guy. I don't know if he's a bad guy. I don't know exactly what he is. But what I do see is something that you alluded to. And I call this kind of like, you know, very flippantly Charlemagne syndrome, where Putin, you know, and I understand there's complications with the Orthodox Church and her ties to sort of the Russian government. I get that. But if Putin believes his faith to be true, which I believe he does believe to be true, even though it may be disordered in some capacities, I think Putin's looking at the West saying, you guys have gone nuts. This is the pagan West again. I mean, you know, Christian, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, they we revolutionized and we uh, converted a pagan empire at one time, uh, which was Europe. Charlemagne did that because living on borders with a bunch of pagan whores that didn't play by any customary rules that we understand to be good and evil or fair and found in that respect is kind of looking that way here for for Putin. I think that's the way he's looking at us. Whether that's right or wrong, I you know I'm not going to put a judgment on that, but I think he's looking at us and all the things we've done from all this international banking, all this global stuff, all this alternative lifestyle, disordered lifestyle stuff. And I think he may be looking at the West and saying, listen, you guys are right on my border. You guys are intruding here. You guys are filtering this stuff in through, through various forms. We got elites here trying to get into my government, into our country to influence this stuff. Every time something happens in Russia, whether it's the, the punk rock bands or whatever it may be, and Russia puts a stop to it, well, they call him a tyrannical leader because he won't allow license in the name of liberty to exist in many respects. Not that Russia is perfect, not that they've rooted out all that license in their country, but at least they're giving lip service to it. My point here is I think Putin looks at the West and says, you guys have lost your marbles. You guys are nothing but a barbarian pagan empire. You guys support every form of moral degradation, every form of unjust law, every form of, of corrupt global politics. And now I want to protect my country. I think in his mind, in his mind, he's doing what he believes is best for his country. I believe that he is. I mean, what, whether he's playing the Charlemagne syndrome, as you say, or the Machiavelli rule, which is to say, if your people are religious, if you are as the leader is not religious, it would be easier for you to at least put the appearance that you are religious because you'll be able to rule them. If you've never read Machiavelli's The Prince, it's one of the one of the one of the chapters of how the rule a society in a successful way, give the appearance that you are religious even if you're not. Whether that right. is the case, the fact is Putin has built all these churches, he's done lip service, serious lip service, lip service and action, whether it's genuine, I don't know, I'm not there, I don't know his heart, I'm not his confessor, I'm not anything. All, what I do know is it's a lot more serious than a lot of Western leaders have done, have given us lip service, but no substance. Putin gives yeah, lip I, I, Julian, I don't even see the lip service. I don't even see the lip service anymore in the West when it comes to Christianity and faith. It's, they're hostile against it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so again, people can say all they want about Putin's faith. The fact is that, you know, we got all upset when the Russians passed the law for no, none of this alternative lifestyle propaganda. Well, Russia's its own country. If you don't like it, that's fine. But again, as you see, it's this international mindset. It's like, we're all for the alternative lifestyle. So everybody that's on the planet needs to be for it. 
No, we are individual countries, individual people, individual histories and cultures and religions that have different values. We are not a 16 year old woke girl in high school that thinks that everybody believes the same thing as we do. That is not how the real world works. Russia is not for the, el for the alternative lifestyle propaganda. Yeah, Just because you aren't for it, USA doesn't make Russia or Putin or anybody else bad because that's what they believe. You, you, you know, you don't want them being upset or bad mouthing you for your, you know, love affair with all things crazy. So don't get upset with them for their love affair of like, yeah, we're going to be normal. Yeah, that's what historian Charles Cologne said last week when he joined us here at Frankly Speaking, where he talked about how this really started under uh, the Obama administration when, in fact, we started pushing the alternative lifestyle and Russia responded by banning the alternative lifestyle. And effectively, a new Cold War over this issue began. And it's funny because many social commentators on social media have commented that over the past decade, you know, the, the red, white, and blue, the stars and stripes, the American flag, that's not even our flag anymore. Our flag is what? It's the rainbow flag. It's replaced the stars and stripes. It's, we've gone so far radically liberal, so far radically progressive on these issues that it's created a Cold War atmosphere. And it's the same issues they've gone after uh, Hungary over and Poland in many respects. And while Poland and Hungary, you know, they got their own issues issues over there, don't get me wrong, uh, they've tried to fight against this. Central Europe in general has been a problem for the West because they've tried to bring them over, but there's some outstanding values there of a Christian origin. They continue their pushback, and I believe this, is, this plays a role in Russia. Whether the Orthodox Church has been infiltrated by communists or, or whether they have this you know, sort of this unordinary relationship with the government over there, you still have the Orthodox faith over there, Julian, that has valid sacraments over there, okay? You know, we Catholics, we may have, well, are they heretics? Are they not heretics? What are they? They have valid sacraments over there. So in that respect, Christianity, you know what? It resides in that culture. And how it manifests itself, um, we can debate that. But I do believe that the Russian people are a true Christian people to a certain extent, unlike America, where there's religious indifferentism and this religious liberty garbage that we make no sense of true faith at all. And then we want to judge other cultures and say how we're better than you when we don't even have any standards of morality anymore. We've become, we've been repaganized, Julian. Yeah, I mean, Russia has it, like, again, has its own problems with the Orthodox Church, like you said, whether, whether it's schismatics, heretics, what, the fact is that they have valid sacraments. The, the, you know, at least the, they have a uniform culture over there. They, you know, whether whether the average Russian goes to church or not, the, th the thing is they have a uniform language, they have a uniform history, and they have a uniform church. You know, they don't have, you know, 50 million other churches there competing for their souls. It's one, maybe two churches or three, Catholic, Orthodox some version of Russian Catholicism and, you know, uh, um, Anglican, the, uh, the, the Anglican church. I know there are, I know there is an Anglican community over there for my time being an Episcopalian. So, but there's not like, you know, 40,000 different denominations over there. So th there yeah. is this uniformity uh, uh, of cohesiveness yeah. in, in Russia that, the West, specifically America and Britain, because Britain is transforming itself into being a smaller version of the U.S., particularly in the cities. Um, you know, there. You know, the Russia has not uh, given up its identity. Russians know who they are. America and the West, they don't know who they are. Right, exactly. And I think pluralism is one of the biggest problems we have here. You know, what's interesting about that is that, you know, I, I believe there is sort of these lobbying groups in America um, that goes even deeper than just the deep state and the left and right sort of paradigm. There was a paper written a few years back 
uh, by the Mormons out here in Utah that really wrote a paper against Hungary and how Hungary has structured our government because Hungary has limited uh, the Mormons from going in there. And I believe the Russians have done similar things with Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons as well, too. And of course, you know, Mormonism being that purely American uh, religion, uh, basically, Witness. right. So Jehovah's Witness, right? But Mormonism with this integral tie to the American founding, right? These ideas that the, the American founding fathers were saints in their sort of their theological realm and things like that. Well, the Russians and Hungary and Poland, which are predominantly more Catholic and Orthodox nations who see through the fraud of religious liberty, have limited their ability to sort of move in there. And so when we see this hostility, Putin's a dictator, Putin's Hitler, or, or uh, you know, Hungary is an authoritarian regime, same with Poland. There is American sensibilities of religious liberties. These are just one of the issues that play a role here where these pluralistic groups, whether it's Mormons or whether it's Jehovah's Witnesses, they're not being allowed to evangelize what many would consider a fake religion founded on the precipice of post-enlightenment society under the scam or really the dubious notion of religious liberty. It's not just the left that attacks Russia, Hungary, and Poland, and these nations. It's really all of the pluralistic West at this point in history because they're protecting their own interests and their own ideologies. They don't want to be told that that really through the prism of history and post-enlightenment civilization that there are a bunch of liars and frauds in the end, Julian. Yeah, I mean, if you want to be cynical about it, you know, all Jehovah's Witness and Mormons are probably the biggest scams in, you know, the history of religion. Now you can the you can be cynical about Christianity and Catholicism and Protestantism, but at least there is, you know, tenable, organic, authentic real history to Catholicism, Protestantism, Orthodoxy, but to these cult apocalyptic, you know, great awakening offshoots of Protestantism, like Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness and the Seven Day Adventists, those things, those are clearly, you know, they're scams. It's quite clear that it's a cult of some sort. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, nobody want and anybody that is an Orthodox who, especially an Orthodox clergy person, is able to you know refute that nonsense in five seconds. Yeah, yeah, but what about freedom, Julian? Why are you against freedom? Because, again, it's this idea. It's this idea the 16 year old woke girl that everybody shares my you know beliefs and this I, this entitlement of americans that whether you're traveling as an individual citizen or you know as uh, as a as a country on the world stage that everybody's just supposed to you know worship american ideals and worship america like, like you know if you if you've ever traveled abroad, you know, who, you know, in all of these like surveys or whatever the case may, polls or whatever, Americans are consistently always like the worst tourist. They're all, they're disrespectful, they're loud, they're entitled, they're obnoxious. They're all of these things, you know, uh, Americans just think that you know the world just revolves around them in every way, shape, and form. That that includes politics and policies. Right. right. You know, like it's boycotting with the oil, as if you know the rest of the world isn't boycotting uh, Russia's oil. So it's uh, it's only going to work out for Russia in the long run. They're they're just going to get richer. Uh, again, you know, all of these international globalist things pulling itself out you know i keep seeing all these memes about how like by the end of this you know the russian man is going to be like the juggernaut you know you know you know no porn no international banking 
you know, no McDonald's, no Starbucks, no Netflix. He's going to be jacked. He's going to be nine feet tall and, you know, he, living the life. But, yeah. uh, but in, the, the meme may be an exaggerated being fun, making fun, but it's true. The right. only thing all of these globalists pulling things out of Russia is going to do is just make Russia even more in self-sufficient than it already is. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're absolutely right with that. I know Tucker Carlson brought that up. The, the fact that oil prices are skyrocketing, it only benefits the finances of Russia with the rising oil prices as well too. The other thing I've never understood is we're not willing to drill here in the name of environmentalism, but we're still willing to buy oil from other countries that are apparently destroying the environment. What is the effective difference? There really isn't none. I mean, this is just nonsense. You know, the other thing they brought up too is recently, well, you know, it's time to shift to alternative energy. Everybody go out and buy an EV, an electric vehicle. Listen, most people are not going to be able to afford that thing. I mean, the cheapest class of EV, a Tesla right now is like $45,000. That's the cheapest. Never mind the maintenance costs. You can't take that to your regular mechanic. You're going to buy a $5,000, uh, you know, again, uh, insurance policy for that, or should I say a warranty tax license. You're not walking out of there cheaper than fifty-five dollars to $60,000 a year to save what? As Joe Biden said, $80 a week. Most people I'm can't not, afford a $40,000 car. The mining for those Tesla batteries is yeah. it's, it's even worse for the environment. Yeah, you're right. You're right about that. And and here's the other factor is within 10 years, within 10 years, you got to buy a new battery for your electric vehicle, which runs $10,000. Tell me how a lower middle class family is supposed to support a, what, what becomes effectively a sixty to $75,000 vehicle long term. It's impossible. That, that the, 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 Listen, I'm all in favor of alternative energies, right? But it's got to be cost effective for everybody, and we're not there yet. And all we're going to do is empower Putin here by raising these prices, talking about EVs, you know. And so then the administration's the teach, you know, you know, really speaks to us like we're idiots, right? They shut down the the Keystone Pipeline, and now they're telling us, well, you know what, we're drilling more than ever before, and it doesn't matter effectively. Well, you know, prices started skyrocketing not when Putin attacked Ukraine, but when they shut down the Keystone Pipeline. You're telling me that's not a coincidence, right now? Of course, listen, you can hand out your 900 permits, but if you're handing out permits where there's no oil, those oil companies are not going to be able to do anything with those permits. We're all being bullshitted here, Julian, one way or another. And I believe, again, going back to Ukraine and Russia itself, as I've been kind of uh, digging deeper into this, when you look at the players from George Soros and Western leaders and a lot of even corporations, things like that, we're being fed a narrative that just doesn't sit right in my mind right now. There's something the more to this. Wrong. It literally is. You know. It. it you know. I, I saw one meme, and it's. Uh, it's this person dangling like a thing in front of them, and this person has like I'm hypnotized eyes. On on the left side, it's the hypnosis uh, of uh, of the COVID virus. Then on the right. It's the hypnosis of the Ukrainian flag. It's literally yeah. overnight went from COVID to Ukraine. It, it's, Amazing. You know, yeah. it literally, Putin bad, Zelensky good. It literally, it, yeah. it's just the propaganda is so strong. And, yeah. and it's just like, as Tucker Carlson mentioned, literally overnight, and nobody questioned it at all. You literally... Nobody's talking about COVID, but we're all talking about Ukraine. The, emo yeah. the, like, the way that the narrative from the politicians to the news media have completely removed any nuance, any clarity, any, any type of actual critical thing. It's all feelings, all emotion, yeah. all, 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 all zero to 60. It's just, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. Yes, I see exactly. That's why I'm not buying the narrative. I'm not buying any of this right now. What I'm being told right now, because it has sort of flipped like that in an instant in many respects. And and listen, they locked us down for two years with COVID. 
And now we got a war and gas price so skyrocketing high now. At this point, we're locked down again, Julian. I found myself looking at my gas meter the other day, just running a few errors, thinking, like, look, I got to need another 60, 70 bucks to fill this up, man. And nobody's getting raised sufficient to deal with this. Inflation is killing us. I mean, I, you know, I'm grocery store. I'm paying 20% more. They're telling us it's 7% inflation. I'm going to tell you right now, if the government is telling us 7% inflation, it means we have 15% inflation. That's what it means, yeah, Julius. Like I, I, I had to miss my I, – I didn't have to, but I chose to – because um, you know my my choir rehearsal was on Monday. It's it's thir it's forty minutes away from where I live, um, and I was down there um, on Sunday, and I was by the time that I got back, my um, my empty light was on. I know that I can do about you know maybe 15, 20 miles when the empty light comes on, and I'm like, well. If I drive back to if I drive to rehearsal, I know I'm gonna have to fill up. I'd rather wait till payday and be on E because I know I don't have to really go anywhere that's like gonna make me be completely out of gas. And so I did that. But it's just like you know, now I have to make those decisions. <laughs> I know. We all do. It's, yeah. It's just like I mean it, Every single night, literally, I keep every single time I wake up, I get a notification, another historic, you know, for gas in Pennsylvania. I mean, we are literally, I made like at the start, like when, when the gas started going up, I made the predicament that, you know, gas will be $5 by summer, by the, by the, by, by the, by, by summer or, you know, by, by, uh, by Easter. I, I'm actually, I, I, my prediction is more likely to be off for Pennsylvania. We might be at $5 a week before Easter. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and, and if, if history has any sort of a say in this, we'll probably be at $7 by the summer. That's the irony of it all here. And so, listen, I don't know where we're going with this whole Ukraine-Russia thing. Uh, I, I definitely not in favor of war. I'm I, I'm definitely praying. Listen, I, I we're doing our St. Joseph novena here at the house, and we're offering up to St. Joseph for our intentions. One of them is for world peace. I definitely don't want to see any Ukrainians die. I don't want to see any Russians die. I hope this thing ends peacefully. But at the same time, I'm not buying the narrative. I'm being fed. Listen, when I go to Drudge Report, which is now a leftist site, and the first thing I see is, well, Putin is Hitler. You know what? When that Hitler card comes out, when that Hitler card comes out, I'm very skeptical. I'm very skeptical. That's saying yeah, Putin's a good guy. Hitler for everything. I mean, I, Hitler. Yeah. We Hitler's everywhere. I mean, I if there was a bunch of Hitlers all over the place, I feel like half the world would be gone by now because yeah. you know, you know, be killing six million people a day, a, a year. I mean, all these Hitlers everywhere. Yeah. We're all being BS. That's what I sense. Um, I'm hoping this this thing comes to an end, but I believe there's forces behind the scenes, uh, sort of faceless entities, nameless entities that we don't see that are pulling the string, the, the you know strings like a puppet show here at this point in history. I believe there's an alternative agenda here to get governments to use extraordinary powers to enslave all of us, great reset, whatever you want to call it, bring in co full-blown communism. I don't know what it is, Julian, but I sense there's something wrong here. And, and it starts here, Russia, Ukraine. How far this goes, I don't know. But I feel like I'm being BS. Give me your final thoughts, my friend. I think, I think you know, what is going on, I think, think I'm not necessarily rooting for Russia or for Putin, but I really what, what Russia is doing, I think, is good in the fact that they're standing up to the globalist, is that you don't have to be part of the international banking community. You don't but have to have but is that conspiracy on your part? Because this is what the classical liberals are going to say to you is that's a conspiracy. 
Putin is evil. He's a murderer. He's a murderer. That's what Putin really is. Murdering what? I mean, who is he murdering? Journalists. And, 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 journalists and, and, in the press. Oh, 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 the, the priest. Oh, okay. He's murdering priests. I got it. You know, because journalists press. are the equivalent yes. of the West as priests. Because, of course, all these people who are saying he's a murderer are journalists and talking classes themselves. Because, you know, if they went over there and spewed the garbage that they spew, they would be in hot water. But, you know, they're never held to account here in America. So, I mean, I guess that's a, you know, they, they can run their mouth off, you know, and the bill never comes due. But if you run your mouth off in Russia, you disappear. And we have no idea what happens to you. But we're over here in the West. We're just going to instantly say murder. Yeah, pretty much it. Well said, my friend. Listen, my final thoughts are simple. I don't know exactly what's going on over there, but my uh, uh, BS meter is is way up there at the very top. It's ready. It's ready to burst open here. I think we're being set up for something bigger. I think, like you said, Julian, the fact that COVID is gone. We've cured COVID. Did Putin cure COVID? Because it sure seems like Putin cured COVID at this point in history. I think we're being set up for something bigger. Like I said, entities and names and faces that we don't know and don't see. And uh, our media is complicit with this grand conspiracy. If you want to call it that, I'm generally not a conspiratorial person. But we've had too much BS in the West over the last couple of years. We're always in an uproar. We're always in crisis mode. And conveniently enough, whenever we're in crisis mode, the powers that be get to take even more control over our lives. It's funny because in Americans, we talk about freedom, liberty, freedom, liberty. And yet they've been robbed left and right and still no talks of, re, uh, I guess, reinvigorating natural law in the West, which is really the great crime of our time and the reason why the West is descending into the ash heap of history. Julian, my friend, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. All right. Great conversation. That's Julian DeMarco, my good friend of the May He Rain vlog. This is Frank signing off for Frankly Speaking. Good night, everybody. Good night.